I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Every worker in the country, farmers, bank presidents, streetcar conductors, dentists, teachers, clerks, mechanics, even unskilled laborers, work three months of every year to pay for what government spends. But the rich pay the taxes. Why should I worry? That's where we're fooling ourselves. Why, if government took all incomes over $5,000 a year and taxed them 100%, that would pay the cost of government for only four months. Everyone, whether in the factory, shop, farm, or office, pays for the cost of government. Well, suppose we do. But I am willing to pay taxes to provide national defense for my country to see that we have an army, a navy, and airplanes strong enough to protect us against any invaders. Every American agrees that our country's defenses must be so strong that no nation would dare attack us. We don't want what has happened in Europe to happen here. Let us not forget the lesson taught by Europe's agony. We all know that England and France tried the easy way that France under Premier Léon Blum had a new deal similar to our new deal, and that today the French people have paid in blood and sorrow the price for that fatal experiment. Every thinking patriotic American favors this country building up its national defenses at once. That job has been delayed far too long by the experimenters in Washington. No one today disputes the need for a powerful army, navy, and air force for our national defense, for these taxes are willingly paid. But our money has not been spent during the last seven years for national defense. In the last seven years, the New Deal has spent the breathtaking sum of $58 billion. Of this total, only $6 billion and $900 million were spent on national defense. So-called defense taxes now being imposed are not sufficient to meet the ordinary deficit much less to pay the cost of past, present, or future defense. What did we get for the money spent by the New Deal for defense? Ranking officers of the Army have told Congress, in effect, that our national defenses are woefully inadequate, that we lack automatic rifles for our infantry, that we need tanks and anti-aircraft guns, that few of our airplanes are modern in the light of the lessons taught during the European War. Money spent on the visionary Passamaquoddy project for the harnessing of the tides would have bought guns and tanks, which we now need so badly. The Florida Ship Canal, another wasteful boondoggling failure, into which the New Deal has squandered more millions instead of spending money for necessary additions to our national defense. The abandoned canal is now just a big mosquito breeding ditch, the costliest hole ever dug. Billions scattered in all directions, except to improve our Army, Navy, and Air Force. New agencies, new departments, new bureaus, more and more job holders to run these agents. In the last seven years, the number of civil employees of the federal government has increased by almost 400,000, and increased double the size of our regular Army, and many of them receiving salaries far above that paid to the average man and woman in this country. The chief task of this great army of job holders has been to figure out ways and means to spend more and more of your money. Greater spending, greater debts, increasing taxes. Already the national debt is at record high. In 1917, our debt was not much more than the amount we now pay in annual interest. In the wake of the World War, the national debt rose to $26 billion. Then the enormous total is reduced. Slowly it moves downward and prosperity blankets the nation. Machinery whirls, railroads rush carload after carload from producer to consumer. Despite honest efforts for recovery, depression increases the national debt. The national debt rises. 1933, 22 billion and up, up it goes. Down go employment and earnings. 
1937, the mounting debt has its impact on our struggle to recover from the depression. Factories close, unemployment, unrest, but the debt continues soaring, up to 40 billion, to 45, and now on its way to 49 billion dollars. Such a debt, created by wasteful and reckless spending, today makes more difficult our job of paying for the national defense we need. The workers' efforts create wealth and supply the money for government spending. The government has no money of its own, except what it takes directly and indirectly in levies and taxes from every pay envelope. Today, more than 25 cents of every dollar of our national income goes for taxes, local, state, and federal. Each of you pays these taxes, taxes that start with raw materials and compound themselves right down through manufacture to the finished product when we buy it. Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau said recently that more than 60% of the taxes collected by the federal government are paid by consumers, and that means every one of us. In collecting these hidden taxes, the busiest tax collectors of all have no titles and wear no badges. They're the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Hidden taxes are concealed in most of the things they sell. Taxes on taxes that are passed on to us, who pay when we buy the necessities of life. According to statistics compiled by the Northwestern National Life Insurance Company, father works a whole week just to pay the tax on the family's annual food bill. Before the daily bread can be put on the table, all kinds of different taxes must be paid. Every product, every service that makes for comfort and pleasure in the daily life of the American family is taxed in many ways. Families with a monthly income of $200 pay $26.12 a month in indirect taxes. Families with monthly incomes of $150 pay $20.16 a month. Those who live on monthly incomes of $80 were paying $10.25 a month in hidden taxes before we began the long-delayed rearmament program. Every time my lady dresses, she dons as many taxes as she does clothes. When we relax and seek pleasure and entertainment, Mr. Taxes always joins us, and we must pay for him, too. Because of the taxes fastened on the cost of building, the normal cost of this house will buy only this modest home. Automobile owners now pay some $400 million a year in taxes on the cars they drive, taxes that must be paid before the wheels turn. And to add to the cost of every mile traveled and every furrow plowed by farm tractors, the tax paid on gasoline alone reaches the astounding yearly total of one billion dollars. All who drive are drafted into another army of taxpayers. Those who have jobs are putting all these various government bills. Only what is left can be used for the needs and savings of the worker's family. You are taxed to pay the salaries of men like this bureaucrat, symbolic of the mailed fist of centralized bureaucracy that knocks at democracy's door demanding a third term here, rampant in the totalitarian nations of the old world, plunging Europe into war, subjugation of the courts, purges of independent legislators, perpetuation of the executive in office, regimentation, war. It must not happen here. But liberty survives only for those who are wise enough and strong enough to preserve it. Let us rid ourselves of our New Deal failure before it's too late. Let us end wasteful spending and return to the good old American sanity and economy. All Americans must unite to stop the New Deal with its lust for power to perpetuate itself in office for another four years. It is in our self-interest to preserve the heritage handed down to us by our fearless forefathers. To save ourselves, we must dismiss incompetence and radicals from high places of government. We must elect Wendell Wilkie president and speedily become so strong, no foe would dare attack us. To that end, let us now dedicate ourselves in a holy crusade that government of the people, by the people, for the people, perish from the earth. Oh,